on many Sunday nights over this past year, coming through uh, 2020, um, I've preached along the theme for our church for the year, which was living for what really matters, and we've talked about a great number of subjects that really matter to God, that really matter to the child of God. Eternity, uh, we talked about, we've talked about love really matters. We've talked about life really matters, and, and the Word of God really matters, and we've gone through a host of subjects, and uh, i got to say, and I've said this before, it didn't go completely as planned, because I scheduled out messages to go along throughout the year, and then services were disrupted here and there, or we had some uh, special things, but... I, I do believe, and I can rest in that God's allowed to be communicated what he wanted communicated. And now we're in the month of December, and um, what I'm going to do, God helping me, and certainly his will is above mine, is uh, tonight and next Sunday night, I'm going to preach still along this theme over a particular subject, and then the last Sunday night of the month, which is the 27th, which is also the last Sunday night of the year. Let that sink in for just a second. Uh, number one, it's gone by quick. And number two, it hasn't gone by very quick. At least this year anyway, or not quick enough, maybe we could say. But non nonetheless, um, uh, two Sundays from tonight is the last Sunday of the year. And I will be introducing our theme for the following year. Uh, 2021, and I'm very excited about that. Psalm 3, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? He's not asking a question. He's exclaiming there. He's saying, wow, it seems like there are many people that are bringing trouble into my life. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Salah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Salah. I laid me down and slept. I awake, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone, thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Silah. Tonight, um, in a very direct way, what I want to call our attention to, by calling attention to, to what the content of the passage is, I want to call even greater attention to what the passage is. And that is, it is a prayer. Now we know that because when David begins, he makes an address and he says, Lord. Now there's nobody in here that that's your name, so he's not talking to you. He's talking to God. And he says, Lord. And then he begins to pour out his heart before God. Now let me point out here just a couple of things about the context, the greater context of this passage. When David here prays and chooses to pour out his heart unto the Lord, his heart would have been incredibly broken at this time. It was nothing new in David's life for enemies to pursue him. Has anybody ever read uh, 1 Samuel 18 through... Uh, well, pretty much the rest of his life. David always had enemies pursuing him. David always had enemies. And by the way, David never asked for enemies. 
Matter of fact, a case could be made that David never did anything himself that caused these enemies, but rather God anointed him to be the next king over Israel. And as soon as that was realized by other people, namely Saul, he was hated, he was pursued. There were many that tried to take his life, but this is, this is different. This isn't Saul chasing him around the, the Israelite countryside. This isn't the Philistines trying to over, overtake him in battle. This isn't the Amalekites that David was known to go up against. This is not the enemies that are after David. This is his own son who's trying to take him out. This is his own son who's trying to bring a legitimate coup against uh, his father. And, and he, wants his, he wants his father removed from the picture so that he can rule and reign over the nation of Israel. And so it's while fleeing from his own son and his son's military forces that had allied themselves with him that David writes this psalm. And not only this, but the psalm uh, is a product of a prayer. If you, if you want to know, was David trying to write a worship lyric for church services? No. This psalm was born out of a heart of prayer from David when he cried out to the Lord. But, but the content of this is very important unto us. But what I want to really focus upon is that what we have here in the Word of God is a recorded prayer of one of God's servants. Now, look at this prayer. Lord, and then after he addresses the Lord, he states the obvious. You know, sometimes there's people that don't want to pray because they've got this mindset. What's the point of me telling God something he already knows? What, what's the point? of bowing down and praying to God. If he's God, then he already knows what I'm going through. Why would God want me to tell him what's going on in my life? Well, the truth is God doesn't need us to explain to him our circumstances. God doesn't need us to tell him what's going on in our life. But here's the thing. God is a personal, relational God that wants to hear from his children, and he likes for us to explain to him where we're at. He wants to hear that from his children. God is not against David for crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, this is my circumstances. This is how I feel right now. Well, how do you feel, David? I feel like I'm surrounded. I feel like I'm pursued. I feel like everywhere I turn, there are people that are trying to bring trouble into my life. Now, here's why I say that the fact that he's praying is bigger than the content of his prayer is because maybe you're never in the same exact situation that David is, but that doesn't mean that what David prayed doesn't apply to your life. Because while you may never be surrounded by military people that are trying to take you out and take your life, all of us know what it is to face trouble of some kind. And all of us know what it is to be overwhelmed by trouble, overwhelmed by trouble. I can't help but think about some of our own members right now that it wouldn't be a stretch to say at all that everywhere they look, there's trouble on all sides. I've asked you on many occasions and I I sincerely believe that you are, to, to pray for um, Jeremy and Melanie Hall. My heart goes out to them right now because it's been a rough year. Difficulty has abounded. There's been trouble on all sides. There's been loss of loved ones. There's been uh, health problems with family members, now health problems personally, uh, and, and, and many other things that haven't been discussed and haven't been disclosed. And, and that's on top of all of the things that we're all facing right now. 
And I'm telling you, there are times in our life, and if you've not been there, just hang on, because there's a good chance that time will come where you just feel like you're overwhelmed by all of the trouble that surrounds you. And sometimes you, you can't help but feeling like, man, I just can't catch a break. Have you ever been there? I'm, I'm dealing with this over here and I'm seeking the Lord and I'm, 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 trying to be, I'm trying to be honest and I'm trying to do things right and I'm trying to follow him and I'm, I'm dealing with this problem and this struggle only to turn and, and find out that here's a struggle over here and then I turn over here and here's another problem and it's easy to feel like at times that wherever you turn, there's trouble. No, it might not be a son who's trying to abdicate uh, uh, who, who's trying to uh, take the throne and, and take your life or something like that. It's not that his immediate circumstances are the exact same things we deal with, but it's easy to see in the first part of his, his prayer here that he just proclaims to the Lord, God, I'm overwhelmed. You ever been there? It's not a fun place to be. It's not an easy place to be. He says, Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. You see, this reminds us that the devil is real. He hates God and he hates humanity because humanity was created in the image of God. I just want to help you out with something. If you're a human being, the devil hates you. And it's not because you've ever done anything to make him mad. You didn't have to. You were created in the image of God. You are dear to God's heart, and therefore, he hates you because he hates God. And he doesn't play fair. All the way from the beginning, we were told that he was more subtle than any other created being. And he is subtle. And he is sneaky. And he doesn't care if you're overwhelmed. As a matter of fact, when you're overwhelmed, you're probably at your most vulnerable. And the one thing that he loves to do with God's people is bring discouragement into, into their life. It's not enough that we would be overwhelmed by the circumstances of life only then to have the devil whisper, whisper in our ear, by the way, there's no help. There's no way out. You're stuck. You're downtrodden. And don't, don't think to go to God because God's not going to help you. As a matter of fact, one of the de devil's favorite lines, the whisper in the ear of a child of God, is how much we're unworthy of the grace, the mercy, and the help of God. And you know what? The reason that he can get by with that line is because it is true to a certain extent. We are unworthy. And we can remember our past, and we can remember the things that we've done against God, and he wants to cause us to forget God's grace and forget God's mercy and start believing the lie that God's not going to help us, or maybe even like Job's friends tried to convince him of, that God's mad at us, and that's why all of this calamity and trouble is surrounding us. But David had enough faith to go to God in prayer and say, God, I am overwhelmed and there are many that trouble me and there are many that rise up against me and there are many that say unto me uh, that there is no help for him in God, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. David, by faith, saw past the lies and the deception and by the overwhelming nature of his circumstance. And it was real. Boy, his circumstance was real. I cannot imagine having to very quickly gather my family and some faithful servants and head out the back door of my home and cross over the valley and go up into the hills and keep going with my family to avoid detection and to avoid being found only to along the way have enemies that rise up here and pop up here and 
Here he is, he's escaping from Solomon, and while he's, uh, not Solomon, Absalom, he's escaping from Absalom, and while he's escaping from Absalom, here's this guy named Shimei, who's over one hill over, walking along with David's escaping family, kicking dirt, casting rocks, and saying, yeah, you had it coming. Yeah, run, you coward. I'm going to tell you, that would affect anybody. It affected David's servants. One of David's mighty men said, who is this dog that he would say these things about the king? In other words, all he was doing was over there barking and kicking up dust. But David's, uh, David's captain said, he's annoying. Let me go cut his head off. And David said, no, just let him go. Let him say what he needs to say. Because David refused to hear the discouragement. And rather, when he would have opportunity, I can see David taking a posture of humility on his knees before the God of the universe and saying, yes, there are those that trouble me. Yes, there are those that rise up against me. Yes, there are those that add discouragement to my trouble, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. In other words, Lord, I just, I run and hide behind you, and I know I'm safe. Lord, you're my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. Excuse me, David, don't you see what's going on? What do you have to lift your head up about? Well, just one thing. God, he said, you're my glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice and he heard me out of his holy hill. In other words, uh, David had the confidence to know when I pray, God listens. He hears what I pray and he responds. Then, once he said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and by faith he understood that God had heard him, here was his next step. I laid me down and slept. Did you see that? I laid me down and slept is what he said. Now, that's important because how often have we faced trouble and been overwhelmed by difficulty but struggle to do what? Sleep. Struggle to rest. You know what this tells me? That if in this situation, while he's fleeing from Absalom and Absalom's army, if he can lay down and rest, that's only for one reason. That's because he's put it all in the hands of God and he just completely trusts him. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I don't remember the rest of it because I never said that prayer when I was growing up. The only prayer like that I remember was when I was in college and I came across this prayer that said, uh, now I lay me down to rest, a pile of books upon my chest. If I should die before I wake, that's one less test I'll have to take. I remember that one very well from college. But I can't, I can't remember the other one that parents have their kids say and things like that. Now, we said bedtime prayers, but we just talked to God when we pray. But there is something to be said for now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I, I do remember the rest of it now. It's very, it's very morbid. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I've had sleepless nights, and I don't doubt that you have too. But I'm going to tell you, there's rest in the Lord. When you've taken something to Him, and you've truly laid it down before Him, and you've said, God, I trust you with this. I'm going to pray about this, but then I'm going to trust that you've heard my prayer and that you're in control. Listen, we just sang about it. Have faith in God. He's on His throne. 
Have faith in God. He watches or his own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. And when you express that to God in prayer, and then God says, all right, I've got it taken care of. And you say, well, that's all I needed to know. You can lay down and you can sleep. Then I like this next part. He said, I awake. By the way, this particular night, that was no guarantee. But he said, I awaked. But then he acknowledged why. He said, I awaked for the Lord sustained me. There was one reason they didn't catch up to him. There was one reason they didn't overtake him. There was one reason they didn't take his life. And that's because God watched out for him. God protected him. He said, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Well, why would he not be afraid of ten thousand? Look, let's just, I have to stop and explain these things because if we don't use our imagination, we don't get this in the proper perspective. Now imagine it's you against ten thousands of people. Might you have cause to fear? <laughs> Not if God's on your side. The numbers don't matter when God's on your side. I don't know who it was. I'd give them credit. But somebody said, uh, I heard say years ago, God plus you is always a majority. Now, we might even say this. God doesn't even really need you to be a majority. He's always a majority. But I'm telling you, I can trust him. No matter how big the opposition is, I can trust him. David had faced tens of thousands before, and God had helped him and delivered him. So whether it was whether the problem was big in that it was tens of thousands or whether the problem was big in that it was one, but that one happened to be nine and a half feet tall, talking about Goliath, God was always bigger. God was always mightier. God was always smarter. God was always able. So he said, Arise, O Lord, save me. O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. I want to point something out to you real quick. And hear me very carefully. Because all salvation is of the Lord. All of it. But if we're not careful, we could read this and we see that when, he, when David cries out, save me, and when David prays, salvation belongeth to the Lord, we can, our minds can immediately run to salvation from our sin, you know, that kind of salvation. Let me tell you something. Not every time does the Bible use the word saved or salvation is it talking about our salvation like we think of from sin and death. There's all kinds of ways that God saves us. Now, the one salvation that every one of us need is to be saved from our sin, and there's no question about it, Jesus is the only Savior. He's the only one that died on the cross for our sin. He's the only one that raised, rose again from the grave. He is the only one that can forgive sin, and all of us need that salvation. But let me tell you something. There's often times we as children of God, I'm talking about saved, born again, children of God, we need God's salvation of a different kind. I'm talking about when we get ourselves in a mess and we need God's help. I'm talking about when life is a mess and we didn't necessarily make choices that got us into that mess, but life presents its own problems, its own difficulties, its, its own uh, troubles. And we need salvation from that. I'm not talking about forgiveness of sin and eternal life. And as a matter of fact, in this context, David's not talking about that salvation either. David's talking about salvation in his circumstances. We find ourselves needing that kind of salvation too. 
You ever needed God to save you from a financial difficulty? And he did. You ever been in a relationship situation that the only, that the only help was God? And the only way that relationship, whether it's a friendship or a family situation or something like that, the only way it was going to be, be saved is if God intervenes and God intervened. See, sometimes we just get stuck in certain mindsets and we lose sight of the greatness and the vastness of the work that God wants to do in our life. Sure, we all need to be saved, and I'm not downplaying that. And I'm talking about saved from sin and death and hell, I, and, and, and that's, that's necessary. But I'm telling you, as I live my daily life, I need to see the saving hand of God at work in my day-to-day -day circumstances. Sometimes God provides salvation before I ever know there's a problem. That's how good God is. Now, don't get your mind thinking about over on salvation from sin. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about God saves his children out of all kinds of situations, out of all kinds of dilemmas. You understand, God saved Paul and Silas out of that prison. God saved uh, 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 his people Israel by leading them across the Red Sea. He saved them from Pharaoh's army. And tomorrow, you might find yourself in a situation where your only hope is God. And you need God to save you. Can I encourage you? Don't hesitate to call upon him. You don't even have to wait until you're overwhelmed to call upon him. Because the point is this. Prayer really matters. In some ways, there's no best of subjects that we've dealt with through the months of this year. But this is a strong one. Prayer really matters. I feel like one of the greatest things that God has worked on me about in 2020 has been this very subject, prayer. I feel like one thing God has worked in our church about over this past year is prayer. And listen, I'm talking to you, church. We must be people of prayer in every circumstance, in every day of our lives, whatever we're facing, whether we're overwhelmed or not, let's always understand that without him, we can do nothing. And let's endeavor over this month and in the coming year to be people of prayer more than we've ever been in the past. Can I challenge you in a couple things tonight? And be thinking about this. And we're going to talk about prayer of God helping us again next Sunday night. But can I challenge you in this? When you face a difficulty, what is your initial response? You have one. When we face difficulties, all of us have a go-to. All of us have a, a, an initial response that is almost programmed into us. I remember when I was a kid... I had a programmed response when I had difficulty. It's called run to dad. I'm thankful that I had a dad who taught me when I ran to him that he would just take my hand and both of us would run to God. So when I got to the place in my life where I couldn't run to dad anymore, I still knew to run to God without dad. And I'm going to tell you that as a pastor, that's how I want to encourage our church. Whatever your initial program response is when difficulty comes along, here's what I as your pastor want to try to lead us into and encourage us into to let God, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit of God, program into our life that our initial response when trouble comes is let's pray. 
Maybe it's already there, and if so, let's just work on concreting that even more. But I dare say in a congregation even this size, and this is small for a Sunday night congregation, but even in a congregation this size, maybe there's somebody sitting here and you're thinking right now, if I was being honest with myself and honest with God, I'd have to say that my initial response is worry. Or my initial response is, is check the bank account. That's never done any good for me. My initial response is, I don't know, maybe there's some in here, your initial response is still call dad. Call mom. Call grandma. Call grandpa. Call a friend. Get advice. Find out what their situation is. Maybe uh, your, your uh, programmed response is to sink in fear and despair. Maybe your programmed response is depression. I'm just saying that's a possibility, even for a child of God, that we have this pre-programmed response that whenever difficulty comes, I'm telling you, everyone has it. Everyone responds initially to trouble in some particular way. Is it to immediately go to God and say, Lord, I don't know what's going on here, but I just want to stop and acknowledge there's one thing I know. Thou, O Lord, are a shield to me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. And God, I don't know what I'm going into, and I don't know how bad this is going to get, and, and I don't know how deep this problem runs, and, and I, don't, I don't know what, what difficulties that I'm going to face, but God, I do know that you're in control, and I do know that you hear my prayers. And so God, I'm coming to you with this first. How could that not? better your life? How could that not be less stressful? <laughs> to have the initial response when problems and difficulties come to say, I'm going to take that to God right away. I'm not going to sit and let worry dominate my thinking and my attitude. I'm not going to let fear control my decisions. But I'm going to take this information that's just come to my attention and I'm going straight to the throne. I'm going to point out a couple things and I'm done. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have the opportunity to take anything straight to His throne. And don't take that for granted. If you don't believe me, just go back and read Hebrews chapter 4 again. Seeing that we have this great high priest, we have access to God. Direct access to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help when? In a time of need. What is your friend going to say to you that's going to help this situation that's better advice than you're going to get from God? What kind of comfort is mom and dad going to give you that you can't get from the God of all comfort. Are you hearing what I'm preaching tonight? What better place to run than to God who hears our prayers, who's knowledgeable of our situation, and who loves us? One of my favorite kids' songs is the song, uh, and it's probably on my mind tonight because I just heard a video a couple days ago of my son singing it when he was like two or three years old. He is able, he is able, I know he is able. 
I know my Lord is able to carry me through. And I wish I could sing it like he did when he was two or three years old. Because you might not believe this, but he just opened his mouth and let it fly. All the way back then. But the truth is, that, that song is so right. He's able. He'll help you. Prayer really matters. Did you know that God responds to our prayers? And, and, and not just does God respond to our prayers, but just our prayers themselves do something in our own heart to settle our own heart and our own attitude and our own fears just with the knowledge that I've taken it to God, I've laid it before Him, I can trust Him. And I can move on and I can live in freedom knowing that God's in control. I'm challenging us tonight to be people of prayer first. Let that be our first stop when difficulties come. And I'm confident in this that here's what you'll find. Your first stop will end up being your only stop. Because where else would you need to take your needs further than to the Lord? He's a good God. He's a capable God. And He helps His children. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help...